Hello everyone, Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense. Thank you for watching. I have another Monday quarterback video for you. I'm gonna play this video and talk about things that are going on in the Bears finals going on and talk about things that I think that are being done right and or done wrong. So this is not a typical um, critical incident kind of video. There's no officer involved shooting um, that occurs in this video or any use of force. Uh, this is an incident that occurred in Sandy, San Diego County in the San Marcos area at a uh, sports complex. You will uh, hear gunfire in the background, and then you'll see a projectile actually land in the field where the children are. So I'll play this, and then we'll talk about some stuff. Oh, and be ready. Don't let it get by you. Be ready. Don't let it get by you. Oh, and be ready, don't let it get by you. Oh, and be ready, don't let it get by you. <clears throat> so, um, to best of my knowledge, they're still looking into who did this. Uh, chances are they're probably never going to find out who did this. Uh, but let's say they did find out who did this. What's going to happen? What would happen to that person? <clears throat> well, let's start off with talking about who the person possibly is. So, like I said, no one knows who it is. But I say that there's a good possibility that the person who did this is probably a person who's been involved in the criminal justice system more than once. In what way, I don't know, but I'm, I feel it's just a gut feeling. I got a feeling they've been involved in the system more than once. <clears throat> but what would happen if they actually caught this person? Well, I don't know California law very well at all. I don't live in California. I live in Kentucky. Uh, but if they caught this person, I, one, I would assume that uh, if it's uh, San Marcos' is city limits, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's a, a city or an unincorporated area. It's just an area that the sheriff's office covers. I, I don't know. But there's some kind of ordinance there. Uh, they could be charged with an ordinance for discharging a firearm in a um, uh, city environment or, or urbanized environment, something like that. Um, that could be like a little small local violation kind of thing. Um, aside from that, like state level charges, uh, they could get something um, basically be being charged for um, knowingly putting people at risk of serious physical injury or harm. I don't know what California calls it. Uh, Kentucky would call that wanton endangerment. Um, and they would be charged for however many people were on that field. So there's like 11 kids and one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five adults that I can see. So 11 kids, five adults. So they would be uh, charged for uh, those counts of wanton endangerment. Uh, maybe the people over here and it could be everybody who's in attendance at this you know they take names and be like all right there was uh, 25 people well that person could be charged 25 times for you know wanting endangerment 25 counts of wanting endangerment or whatever california calls it <clears throat> would they get a whole lot of time for that mm, depends on their criminal history um, or it can depend on their criminal history. If they haven't had a whole lot of stuff in their criminal history, um, there could be some leeway given there. If they've had some stuff in their criminal history, uh, that could mean that they get just a little bit more extra time, but probably still not going to be dealing with the full amount of time. They may be able to, um, after being caught and charged with this wanton endangerment, spend a little bit of time in jail, bond out, be out on bond, 
to go through the hearing process, and the prosecutor may say, you know what, this is your uh, first or second time uh, committing crimes, your other stuff hasn't been too serious, uh, we will... Uh, you, you spent a, a month in county jail before he was able to meet Bond. We'll give, uh, we'll consider that time served, give you some credit there. You did a month in, and then we'll give you uh, um, uh, probation. We'll put you on probation for uh, three years or two years or something like that. If you, could, you do anything while you're on probation, you get in trouble, you can get locked back up again. That's a real possibility. And here's the kicker they do get in trouble again while they're on probation <laughs> it's not a simple oh we got you we're throwing you back in no there's a whole process with that they actually have to go back to court again over that thing have a hearing on it and then they'll determine whether or not their probation gets revoked it's not a, a, a very simple thing If that's not the route that's taken, if they say, well, we're going we're gonna to send this to you to some time in, in prison, let's say there was a final sentence capable of three years. And they say, all right, we're going to give you three years. They're not doing exactly three years. It's just not happening. Because there's a percentage of time to serve before being eligible for parole. So they could give them three years, tell them there's a percentage that they got to serve, uh, and then they could be eligible for parole. They serve, you know, they got to serve a year and a half, and then they'll be eligible. Well, they could serve that, and then so long as they don't have any serious uh, disciplinary reports or incident reports while they've been in prison, they've completed some classes, been, you know, really good character, they could go to parole board and get out early. While they're in prison, they can complete classes. Um, that helps shave off time for their sentence overall. So let's say they, they did do three years. Um, or they 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 didn't get to be eligible for parole or whatever, but they were their final sentence to three years. They, for some whatever stupid reason, didn't get parole. Let's say the, the people on the parole board were like, you know what, a kid could have died. No, we're just not going to give you parole. Uh, serve out well they could take classes like SAP substance abuse program MRT stuff like that work in the kitchen and so long as they don't have any disciplinary reports written against them that are substantiated they get automatic good time so like month by month they get X amount of time shaved off their sentence just for not having any reports filed against them and for you know completing a class you know they get you know, a couple months shaved off, something like that. <clears throat> and these are attendance-based courses. I mean, you literally, all you got to do is show up. I mean, how hard is that? You're in prison. What the fuck else you got to do? <laughs> they got a busy schedule, huh? <laughs> it's a given. Like, they're going to get the credit for it just by showing up. Now, they got little workbooks they got to do, you know, talk about the feelings and, like, really stupid stuff. Like, really stupid stuff. Simple. Little children could do this. And they're going to get time credit for it. So even if a person was caught and charged appropriately for all this, they're not getting in any real trouble. Even if they hit one of those kids. Even if they hit a kid and the kid died. They're, they're sure as shit not getting a murder conviction. Here in Kentucky, they would probably get convicted of a reckless homicide. That's one to five years. And even then, <laughs> let's say they, you know, let's say they were sentenced to five years for a reckless homicide doing the full five years it's not happening there's even written into law for mandatory reentry supervision so let's say you get five years exactly 
you're going to be mandatorily released <laughs> before the five year mark. It's a given. Automatic, already written into law. But on top of that, complete these stupid classes, work in the kitchen, don't have any reports written against you, get out a little bit earlier, hit parole, whatever. Um, these disciplinary reports. So, prisons, um, prisons and jails have a very high turnover rate. And there's a lot of people who work in these places who are like the Paul Blart types. <laughs> um, <laughs> like no joke man like there there are some goofy people who work in jails and prisons and some of them are they're literally scared like they don't they don't want no smoke they don't want to do anything um, by themselves they don't want to press issues and a lot of times they are by themselves and because they're short staffed they don't have a lot of people to go around so they let a lot of stuff go because uh, they don't you know, they don't want to get beat up. <laughs> um, a lot of them are just lazy. Like, they really don't want to do anything. Like, they literally just want to clock in, clock out. Do an eight, hit the gate. They don't want to stay writing reports. They don't want to deal with stress. They just want to come in, work their pod, pass out some toilet paper, pass out some grievances, and that's it. And then go home. They're not motivated to do a thorough Cell search. They're not motivated to get onto them for sagging their pants. They're not motivated to do much of anything. Some of them, it's a struggle for them to even show up to work. <laughs> it really is. Like they, they are. Some of them are late all the time. Some of them are calling in all the time. They do not care. So you literally have prisoners who are doing bad things in prison. They're breaking rules. They're doing stuff they're not supposed to. There's prison guards who know about it. There's jail deputies that know about it. But they don't want to press the issue. They don't want to do anything. They just want to clock in, clock out, go home. And so these people never have disciplinary reports written against them. And sometimes um, you, you'll you have uh, state inmates who should be sitting in a state prison somewhere but they'll be allowed to go reside in a county jail in a work release program so the state will actually give that county jail money to house that state inmate and that state inmate could be who you see working on the side of the road picking up trash or they could be working in the kitchen of the jail um, or they could be in a program to where like the humane society can come pick them up from the jail and then take them to the humane society and make them clean the dog kennels and take care of the dogs or a local fire department could come pick up some inmates and bring them down to the fire station and have them sweep and mop and clean the trucks and mow the grass and, and all that stuff. And these jail administrators of these Class D programs um, and the jailers, they want that money coming in from the state. They want it. That, that, that helps them fund positions within that jail that helps them get more equipment that it's a source of revenue it really is and they don't want to lose that source of revenue by losing a bunch of people by uh writing everybody up for everything and taking them off the program and putting them in lock up and all this so you have class d people who will overlook things and then they'll tell the people well we're not going to send up a disciplinary disciplinary report uh up and make you lose your good time we'll just put you in the hole for 24 hours or 48 hours and then then you can go back to general population that happens with a lot of regularity but the general public doesn't know anything about that because they don't know how the how the jails and prisons work um there's no there's no transparency with that stuff there really isn't if there was more transparency about how that side of the house works with the criminal justice system people would be appalled like they would they would be sickened and I wish there was an easier way to expose that stuff, but there's not. I mean, you can't get, you can't easily get any kind of video footage from inside a jail uh, because under open records law, the jailer can deny that request because 
disclosing video of inside the jail could jeopardize the security of that jail. People could know the layout. What people? The prisoners? They already know the layout. They fucking live there. <laughs> what, are we, what security are we protecting here by denying a records request for a camera footage in a hallway? What? Are you afraid that some random ninja is going to break into the jail and, and let people out? <laughs> That's just stupid. But they, get away, they can get away with uh, denying open records for safety and security reasons. And that's that can be good and bad. Um, that can be good to help um, to help the jail be able to operate the way it needs to be without a whole lot of scrutiny. Um, but it's also bad because, well, there's no transparency going on there and sometimes there needs to be scrutiny on some things. Um, but the general public just has no idea how any of that stuff works. They don't understand the courts. The courts aren't transparent. Like, you don't have the the freaking judge Facebook page who releases you know these little statements about what's going on in the courthouse, right? Like, I I mean I haven't seen anything like that in my state. There might be other states that that do that, but you know we got our local police, our sheriff, our state police. They got you know public information officers who make releases to the public. Oh, we went to this car wreck, or we went to this incident. We did this. We did that. Judges ain't doing that. Prosecutors aren't doing that. They're not talking about, well, we've got this guy on uh, murder and, and all this, and, you know, we decided to give him a plea deal. What? <laughs> Why? Why are we entertaining giving murderers plea deals? Why, Why are we entertaining giving bona fide gang members menaces to society people who've been in and out of the system for a decade or more almost their entire adult life why are we taking these people and saying you know what you sure do bring a lot to the table for negotiations we'll work out a plea deal with you <laughs> no like that should not be a thing at all but Prosecutors don't want to go to trial because it is a lengthy process. Like you got to go through all these preliminary hearings and, and all this crap. Um, and then boom, you have your trial. It's a long drawn out process. And some of them get sucked into offering plea deals where they can still get that guilty conviction. Look good for election time. Prosecutors, like, hey, uh, we got uh, we got 200 convictions on this, and we got a 90-something percent success rate, blah, blah, blah. I'm a good prosecutor. And all people see is, oh, I got, you know, 200 guilty convictions or, you know, whatever the damn number is. And people are like, oh, that's, that's really good. You know, they're, they're really, really getting the criminals. <laughs> but they have no idea that these prosecutors are handing out like really lucrative sweet plea deals where people are basically walking free for very heinous crimes and then there's no recourse for that there's no way to go after a prosecutor for that there's no way to charge them for that type of miscarriage of justice so they get to do this stuff without any fear of consequences the only real consequence they have is just not being reelected again. So this has happened, in my opinion, because of the failure of our government to prosecute and lock people away. And stuff like this is only going to get worse. There's going to be more incidents over the years, I believe, of people shooting at each other, trying to kill each other, and stray rounds hitting innocent people. It's just a it's just a matter of numbers. The the more instances that you have of these gun battles with these criminals, the higher the odds that eventually someone's going to get shot. 
and unfortunately, what's going to happen is they're going to attack our gun rights. They're going, oh, gun violence, gun violence, gun violence, gun violence, as if the guns are just jumping upon themselves and, and shooting. And so they will attack the guns. They'll attack the law-abiding citizens who will obey these these you know new laws. And it's going to have zero effect on the people who are currently breaking the laws. They're still going to get the guns. Cocaine is highly illegal. Every state, to my knowledge, criminalizes the possession of cocaine. Cocaine, cocaine, cocaine doesn't even grow. grow. It, it doesn't, doesn't even doesn't grow, grow here. Um, the, the, the plant, plant that, that you need to make, make cocaine, cocaine doesn't, doesn't even grow, grow here. It grows in another part of the world. And then the process that it goes through um, is done in that other part of the world. It's turned into its final product, and then it has to make a journey all the way over here. It has to go through, you know, secret tunnels and boats and little submarines and airplanes and drones. A lot of it, some of it gets caught, a lot of it don't. huge effort to catch this stuff coming in through our borders. It was just the other day that the mayor of was it Tampa? It was like the mayor of Tampa or, or Orlando or something like that. I can't remember which. Um, she was a former police officer, a former chief. She was a former chief of police and then she became the mayor. She was with her family out fishing and found a a huge bundle of cocaine with like a street value of like $1.1 million or some crazy shit. Um, and this was, you know, obviously from someone on a boat running more than one bail. Like, they're not going to be running one bail. Like, they have bales of this stuff. So they were probably transporting millions of dollars of cocaine and they maybe got spooked and started throwing the bales overboard or maybe one fell over. So I don't know. Who knows what happens with it. Um, And the amount of drugs that get captured at the border is is a lot. Like millions of dollars worth of cocaine is being captured at the border. It's highly illegal. It's hunted down a lot. But yet, you can go to pretty much any city in this country and buy cocaine. It doesn't grow here. It's not even manufactured here. It's shipped here. It's highly hunted down, highly combated, highly illegal, but people still get their hands on it. If we can't stop something that isn't even made here from getting here and then being able to find it in every damn city, how the hell are we going to stop the criminals from having guns? We're not. <laughs> They're still going to have the guns. <laughs> and if laws change and possession of guns becomes illegal, the Second Amendment doesn't exist anymore, then the only people who will possess guns will be the police and the criminals. <laughs> and, well, you can say the military, but technically the military doesn't even possess their guns unless they're out training or during wartime. Any other time, their, their guns stay locked up in a vault in the armory. So, on a regular basis, the only people who are going to be possessing guns are the police and the criminals. The law-abiding citizens would not be able to possess them if you know the Second Amendment goes away. Um, so it's not a gun problem at all. It's a people problem. And... We unfortunately suck at getting rid of the bad people. We need justice reform, but not the way the rabid left believes that we need justice reform. We need to get hard on crime. We need to take away prosecutors' abilities to give plea deals on certain crimes and circumstances. Um, and there needs to be some way to be able to have a prosecutor charged for their misconduct and their miscarriage of justice.
we need to change this good time stuff for the prisons. We need to change how we administer probation and parole, who becomes eligible for it, all those standards in place. We need to change that. And I think we need to go to a system of, if you cause problems in the prison, we can add time to your sentence. It's no longer going to be a case of you get time shaved off. It's going to be a matter of you screw around, you're going to get time added. If you want to play games and be gangster, be G the whole time, okay. We'll keep the light on for you. <laughs> Stay a while. We need to be locking away violent people for a very long periods of time. If we say we're going to sentence someone to 10 years for violent crimes, it needs to be 10 years and not a day less. Not a day less. We need mandatory sentencing, long terms, to protect the public, to protect children like this from violent offenders. When a dog becomes vicious and bites people, the people understand that the dog cannot be rehabilitated. The two options for that vicious dog are to be restricted to a kennel for the rest of its life, and the only time it can leave that kennel is going to veterinary visits, and even then it has to be muzzled when it goes out, or the other option for vicious animals is euthanasia. Put them down. You still have some people who, who don't agree with that. Um, but I think by and large, most people understand that. You can't take Cujo, who's bit 15 kids, put him in the dog pound for five years, or two years, whatever, and say, all right, Cujo, it's been two years. You've been rehabilitated. Go on out there. Be a good boy. <laughs> now, Cujo's going to go bite again because there is no rehabilitating the viciousness out of animals. We as a society seem to fail to recognize that you just can't rehabilitate vicious people. The only way I've seen very violent people change their ways is after they've been locked away for an extremely long time and they've become old aged like up in their 60s and 70s. Or, in the very rare case, they found religion and they drastically changed their ideological beliefs and are devout practitioners of their religion. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people who fake that stuff in prisons so that they can go look good in front of the pro board. So it can be kind of hard to discern who's real, who's not. But by and large, the ones who become a lot less violent than what they were are the dudes who, who turn old in prison. Like that testosterone goes away and they start thinking a little bit more clearly. And... even then not all of them change they, they still retain those those thoughts they still retain the the, the, the that bad character the, the bad morals but they could be less likely to act on impulse and go murder people for no reason You can't take an 18, 19, or 15-year-old, or 28-year-old, or 32-year-old violent offender who's been 
caught multiple times for violent things, lock them away for a few years, and then think that they're going to be okay once they get released, that they're not going to be doing violent things anymore. That's crazy thinking. Crazy thinking. So as far as I'm concerned, I think we need to have two options when it comes to the violent human offenders. And that would be the way to make our society a lot safer. All right, so not much else to talk about this video. I could rant on for a longer period of time, but I'm gonna end it right there. If you like what you hear and see, go ahead and give me a like and a share. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button. Stay tuned for more Monday quarterback videos. Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense. Thank you for watching.